the European left is a coalition of European left-wing parties uh, composed of 35 organizations. Today, I am with Nora Garcia to talk about very important topics through this parliament event. So I will now give the floor to Nora and she will explain what we are going to do. Well, thank you so much, Felix. Thank you all for being here to our distinguished guests, to everyone that is uh, watching us. You know that uh, we are also uh, streaming this into languages. So here in uh, the European Left Party YouTube, you can uh, choose uh, which language you want to you want to hear. So thank you everyone for being here. This is a very important event for the European Left Party since uh, we are uh, talking about uh, the African Liberation uh, Day. And for that, we want to uh, frame uh, this moment uh, of exchange, of debate, of also uh, sharing analysis and ways forward to build an anti-imperialist alliance. So today we are going to build bridges among all regions from a working class perspective, uh, from an anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist perspective to uh, think together how we can uh, work uh, to build a world of solidarity, peace and justice. For that, we are going to have an event full of interventions from all around the African region. But uh, before that, we are going to have a moment of introduction where we are going to hear um, Maite Mola um, and also Kwesi Prat. Afterwards, we are going to hear uh, some very important interventions and hopefully we will finalize with conclusions and wave, uh, ways forward uh, to build this uh, European African unity. So thank you so much. Uh, we are very happy to host this event to learn from you all and to also remember the history of this uh, African Liberation Day. Thank you. Hello. So now uh, we are going to uh, introduce um, Maite Mola. I will speak French. I'm Spanish. So it's not uh, my, my French is not perfect. Anyway, it's very important to me as a um, responsible of the European left. My name is Maite Mola, as you can see on the screen. And I want to express gratitude to all the people, the guests, the speakers that attend to this meeting, it is very important to us to have the opportunity to organize something that is not only about theory, analysis, as we usually do. Of course, it has to be done, but we can have this space for interactions, uh, debate, something that is not only there to support the African continent, but the the entire world, because you have Africa. What's what does apply to Africa is applicable to Europe, Asia, and the Americas. I would like to thank uh, Felix uh, and uh, Pieda for everything they've done. Without them, it would be impossible to organize such an event. You have to understand the part played by uh, our workers, but also to the interpreters, because it's always difficult for them, but still, they are doing the work. Anyway, we are all here today as comrades. Comrades that since 63, the day in which the day of the African Liberation was created, have been working together on a fundamental topic, we really want to build international solidarity. Moreover, I would like to be transparent on this. Africa is a very exciting continent from the Maghreb 
you know, in the north of the on the continent until South Africa. This continent is passionate, very diverse. If you look at Europe, of course, we are smaller. But this continent has so many different languages. Africa is so complex and you have to think thoroughly. And I'm sorry, my French is not perfect here. We have to try to reflect on how to understand how such a continent can still be a place of capitalism where transnationals keep fighting to keep access to all the raw material and resources and how is it possible to have a such a bipolar world how is it possible that we still have such a situation in a continent as big as Africa. I think that as European, we should say that we are always talking about how to improve everything like the environment, how we can work on the gender equality, on racism, on solidarity. And I must say that when I look at Africa, it's a great example. It's great for us. Because if you look at Latin America, it's an interesting example. But Africa is still subject to the suffering due to everything we've done, colonialism, slavery, not only what we've done in Africa, but also in Latin America. And everything that these people have suffered from because of Europe. But capitalism is not stupid, trust me. We know that there's the question of environment, raw materials, because in Africa, we know there's an issue with water. Why do we have an issue with water? There's an issue with water because it is being used and we know who is using it. Fisheries, it's the same. All these issues have to be dealt with. In all the countries I have had the chance to visit, in the Maghreb, uh, in the South, I've met with unions. And I can tell you that trade unions are very important. We have to work with them, but also with the political parties, of course. As we are trying to fight for a different world, it has to be based on an international approach. So it has to be done together. We know what's happening in Guinea, in Burkina, in South Sudan. But we also know what's happening in Europe. We are not here to give advice to anyone. I think that the stance of the European Union is horrible with the migration uh, topic, it has been a disaster, really. What's happening right now with the different governments uh, from the far right, it's a total mess. So if together we can keep the struggle, we can keep fighting to build more bridges between ourselves, if we can keep building bridges with the entire international solidarity movement, not only with Africa and uh, Europe, I think at some point we might be able to avoid neo-colonialism to come back because we know where it comes from, the United States, to, to name it. So we should dream, we should dream of a better world, a different world with people that are equals and all the continents on the same level. And that's what I think Africa, the Africa Day should be an international day. We should build the future of the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Maite, for this first energizing intervention. For sure, we are here to work together to focus on what we can do uh, in a, on a practical basis and to build those bridges. Uh, now uh, we are going to hear Akwesi Prat, the General Secretary of the Socialist uh, Movement of Ghana, and also uh, a person that has studied in Kruma for a very long time. So uh, this day that uh, was born in Ghana, uh, maybe bring us this reflection of the past and the present for a better future. Thank you, Kwesi. Well, comrades, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be involved in these conversations. And I do hope that this conversation will lead to a situation in which we begin to work together and to shape the future together, to deepen our internationalism so that what affects us in Africa affects people in Latin America, affect people in Europe, affect people in Asia. This ought to be seen as part of the effort to build international solidarity in the confrontation with capitalism and its, its, its advanced form of imperialism. I've been told to specifically speak about the All African People's Conference of 1958. It is an important conference. It is a conference that brought together newly independent African states and the national liberation movements. And it's a conference that plotted the acceleration of the pace of national liberation throughout Africa. But that conference itself was a product of a history of struggle. It was a product of the broad Pan-Africanist movement which sprang throughout the world long before 1958. And in particular, it was a product of the 1945 Manchester Conference, the Fifth Pan-African Conference in Manchester. For us, in discussing 1958, we cannot ignore the Manchester Conference in 1945, simply because the Manchester Conference in 1945 provided the blueprint for moving forward and dictated what happened in 1958. What's important to recall in 1945 is that 1945 was the first Pan-Africanist con con Congress which brought together many, many Africans from the continent itself. And what is important is also the final resolution of the Congress in 1945. The Congress in 1945 decided that we needed to work together. Wherever we were, whether we were on the continent or we're in the diaspora, we needed to work together to accelerate the pace of national liberation. It also decided that victories of the national liberation movements were not enough and that we needed to work towards the unification of the African continent, the political, economic, and social unification of the African continent. It also then decided that we had a responsibility to construct socialism. The final resolution emphasized the need for African people to build under the banner of socialism as a way of achieving the broad objectives of the independence movement. Now, it is significant that in that resolution, the phrase workers of the world unites. You have nothing to lose but your change featured very prominently in that resolution. So even though it was a Pan-African Congress, its international spirit was clearly you know, visible. Now, it is interesting that in 19, from 1945, and Krumah left Manchester and came to Ghana and became the general secretary of the, of the United Gold Coast Convention. It is significant that Nkrumah did not see the liberation of Ghana from the colonial yoke as an end in itself. He saw it as part of the continental project and indeed saw the efforts to defeat colonialism in the Gold Coast as the effort to create a base from which we could accelerate the national liberation process throughout Africa. Now it is significant that revolutionaries and Pan-Africanists like George Padmore and others 
played an active role in the effort to wrestle you know, power from the colonial administration. It is significant that on the eve of Ghana's independence on 6th March in 1957, Nkrumah declared loudly and clearly that the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked to the total liberation of the African continent. That statement had its foundation in 1945. And that statement clearly spelled out the objective of using Ghana as a base from which to liberate the whole of Africa by all of the revolutionaries in Africa at the time. It is significant also to mention that before then, other leaders in West Africa had formed the West African Students' Union, which was very active in advocating national liberation, not just for the Gold Coast or Nigeria or Niger and so on, but advocating national liberation for the whole of West Africa as a basis for moving forward. Now, it is important also to recall that the 1958 All African People's Conference had been preceded by the 1957 Conference of Independent African States. And I believe very firmly that it was the 1957 Conference of Independent African States which set the tone and agenda for the 1958 meeting in Accra. Indeed, the historical record shows that at the 1958 All African People's Conference, Participants were from 28 countries. And all of them came together, realizing the need to work together, the need to overthrow colonialism, and to a very large extent, the need also to confront capitalist exploitation. It is clear that the objectives of the independence movement were three, three clear objectives. One of the objectives was for the African people to be able to choose their own leaders. Because before then, the leaders of, of the colonies were not chosen by the African people. Indeed, in Ghana, for example, you had the governor general who was appointed by the Queen of England and was not answerable to the people of Ghana, was only answerable to the Queen of England, the English establishment, the, the royal establishment in England. So clearly, one of the objectives of the independence movement was to end this arrogance of imperialism, this arrogance of the colonialists in deciding who should become our leaders and who should not become our leaders. Now, the second objective was clearly for the African people to choose the type of societies they wanted to build. We wanted to decide what kind of societies we want to build for ourselves. And then, of course, the third objective was for us to own our own resources, the resources embedded in our soil, to own those resources and to exploit those resources for the benefit of our people. And those resources are huge. We are talking about gold resources. We are talking about diamond. We are talking about bauxite. We are talking about uranium and so on. Huge resources. Indeed, Nkrumah in his book, Africa Must Unite, makes the point that Africa alone has more than 50% of the total resources of the world. And that is not an exaggeration. So part of the struggle for independence was just to make sure that we own these resources and we exploit these resources for our benefit. Now, there's no doubt that the 1958 conference gave impetus, great impetus, to the liberation efforts throughout Africa. And if you just count the number of countries which became independent in 10 years after 1958, it shows very clearly the impact that the 1958 All Africa People's Conference in Accra made. It is significant to note that just from this time that Ghana set, started setting up guerrilla camps to train the national liberation fighters and to send them back to their countries to engage in these struggles. It's also significant to note the establishment of, 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 the, of, of the Bureau of African Affairs, which was at the center of the provision of diplomatic and material support for the liberation of the African continent. 
So it is very, very important to note these. Now, it's also very important to note that the national liberation struggle in Africa was not just waged by Africans without the help of the socialists and indeed other countries in the world which were largely progressive. And in discussing this, I think it's important to pay attention to Cuban internationalist forces who fought in Angola and defeated the armed forces, the apartheid armed forces in the Battle of Quito Cuanaval. That defeat of the armed forces of the apartheid regime actually set the tone for the defeat of apartheid in South Africa, for the independence of Namibia, and the consolidation of the national independence of, 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 of Angola. It is significant also to point out that even before the Battle of Quito Cuanaval, Ernesto Che Guevara had come to Ghana and helped to develop the guerrilla camps, which trained people to fight in various parts of, of Africa uh, to liberate themselves from the yoke of colonialism and, and, and so on. Now, I think one of the most important questions that we ought to ask today is whether or not the objectives of the 1945 Fifth Pan-African Congress the objectives of the meeting of independent African states in 1957, and the objectives of the All African People's Conference in 1958 have been achieved. Clearly, these objectives have not been achieved. The entire African continent is ruled by neo-colonial regimes, which are more likely to listen to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in the pursuit of neoliberal agendas than to listen to their own people. That is the state in which we are. Today, the African continent is littered with foreign military bases all over the place. You know about Djibouti and the extent to which Djibouti has become the host of foreign military bases virtually from every country in the world. You know that Ghana now has become a base for the US Army. And we know that there are efforts in Zambia to accommodate the US Army and so on. Now, the socialist movement of Ghana to which, for which I work has done some research on, 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 on foreign military bases in Africa, which we are ready to share you know, at the appropriate time. But the situation is worrying and frightening. I recall that around 1958 to 1960, the forebears of our independence struggle made the point that Africa should not house any foreign military and that Africans were capable of defending themselves. Indeed, it was Nkrumah who coined the slogan that he wanted to see a world without a bomb. Today, those aspirations of the African people have been thrown overboard and foreign military presence in Africa is massive. Sorry, Kwesi, but you only have two minutes left. I'm very really sorry to interrupt you, but you have two minutes. No problem. Now, the point to make is simply that these foreign military bases are here to ensure that we do not have control over our resources, that our resources are not exploited for the benefit of our people, and also to subvert international solidarity. So we have a responsibility to wage a campaign against foreign military bases in Africa, and indeed foreign military bases everywhere. We have a responsibility to wage a campaign for building that new world, that new world that people like Nkrumah, like Sekuturi and others advocated for, a new world without a bomb, a new world in which no child will go to bed on an empty stomach, a new world in which those who suffer diseases will have cure, a new world in which access to housing will be improved, a world without a bomb. Thank you, comrades. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure listening to you. And now uh, I'm going to give the floor to Usmana Paila, who is uh, the secretary for in Africa. And we know the method she's using. So Solly. The floor is yours. 
And I give you the yeah. floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. How many minutes I have? Comrade Chair, I have how many minutes. minutes I have? You have 10 minutes, sorry. 10 minutes, thank you. Let me greet uh, all of you, uh, Comrade Program Director um, and Comrade um, Naita Mona, as well as uh, Comrade Kwesi, um, who just gave us a, a good perspective on the continent, uh, Comrade Felix and um, Comrade Nora and all other comrades uh, of the European left present here, fellow panelists, uh, fractional parties present here, um, sister parties from the African continent, comrades and friends, we greet you in the name of South African Communist Party and its uh, working class members who are toiling every day uh, to liberate themselves from the capitalist exploitation, uh, colonialism and neocolonialism. We appreciate this seminar hosted on the eve of uh, Africa Day. We have been asked uh, to share perspectives uh, around anti-capitalist struggle and collaboration between African and European left forces against neoliberal globalization or anti-imperialism. Well, indeed, uh, this seminar is taking place at a time when the world is facing grave challenges against wars, environmental degradation, poverty, energy and food crisis uh, as a whole. And capitalism itself is in the, mid in the midst of its uh, worst ever crisis. Um, and we therefore require an advanced Marxist theory to guide struggles today in order to come out of this uh, massive capitalist crisis. And we appreciate equally the efforts of the, our comrades uh, in the European left for many initiatives that you are taking in the fight against capitalism right in the belly of uh, capitalism. As we know, tomorrow, today, as we will we'll broadcast this uh, on Africa Day, will mark 60 years since the birth of the Organization of African Unity. And I think um, our comrade from Ghana, the GSS, has spoken extensively about this. I won't go too much into that. But safe to indicate that the formation of the OAU was mainly about ending colonialism neocolonialism and apartheid in our case, uh, particularly in the southern tip of the continent. But at the moment, we have, seen, we have witnessed and are still witnessing grave situation facing the African people. We are witnessing resurgence of belligerent imperialism um, that is uh, ravaging the continent, uh, waging wars. Um, in different fronts, and most of these wars that have been waged are affecting the continent, particularly with regard to uh, food security, uh, high cost of living, making it difficult for the people on, on, on the continent to survive on a daily basis. In other words, we have seen also a situation where the world itself it's uh, on the brink of a catastrophe. The imperialist world led by the US and its imperialist uh, 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 European uh, powers, one may even characterize them as stooges of uh, the US imperialism, have equally plunged not only the African continent, but the whole world into a major crisis, causing wars and uh, military escalations and not interested in peace and prosperity for all. We hope today Europe can reconnect with its ideals for peace. We have seen, for instance, the, the disintegration of the Western world system, which we believe at the moment, both Europe and the US are cultivating this system to become a universal system, when actually it is not. And there are many other systems. Uh, the world, humanity must be respected as is uh, its cultures, uh, which must be celebrated in their diversity. But we should continue to reject on the continent this imposition of universal conception of humanity in the eyes uh, or only seen through the prism of the USA and Europe. And of course, we understand that um, part of this crisis 
uh, is a crisis uh, on the basis of the new productive forces uh, emerging uh, to advance the new economy for the world. And that the capitalist world, largely um, led by the US and Europe, are playing second fiddle to the development of new productive forces in the world, by China particularly. And uh, they can't believe that uh, this former colony that was plundered by imperialist forces, whether it's uh, France, Poland, I mean, uh, Japan, Portugal, Britain, can now lead the world in the development of productive forces and uh, be the new uh, country to go to for what perhaps the future of the world could be. Of course, they are threatened by its socialism, particularly because controlling of these new instruments of production, not by a, a public sector, a, a, a nation, but by, not by corporates, it's a threat to them because capitalism wants to control the destiny of the world, whereas socialism will give the destiny of the world to the people themselves. That's why this uh, fight we see even um, in Ukraine, we hope that um, this proxy war in Ukraine, despite its devastation at the moment, we have called for peace and continue to call for peace. But we have seen that Europe uh, and the US are not interested in peace. And the new poster boy of war, Zelensky, is not interested in peace either. Uh, is interested in warfare. He's going from one European capital to an another, garnering more weapons for continued devastations. And we believe that the world, and particularly the, the, the European left, should continue to fight for peace. And we appreciate the efforts that we have made already in the context of fighting for peace um, in, in, in different capitals um, in Europe. At the same time, we are also witnessing a massive attack on the multilateral global system with uh, unilateralism being the order of the day in order to serve the interest of uh, the US and Europe uh, in the main, who are also now developing a new security architecture for the world as well as a new financial architecture for the world in exclusion of others. Obviously, Europe um, should understand that the days of, uh, of, of uh, command and control of African countries and perhaps uh, the countries of the South are gone by. We can see, for instance, if you take um, Western African countries, for instance, um, since 1945, we have a situation where half of uh, their foreign exchange reserves were expected to be deposited, for instance, in the French Central Bank. As you know, France in particular plays a critical role on the African continent as it colonized more than half of existing members of the African Union, that is members of the African countries. And therefore, it is very critical, particularly for our comrades in France and the rest of Europe, to continue to fight against this uh, neocolonialism of France and other European countries that continues to impoverish the African country and its people. Of course, we in the context of this existing development in the world, have um, embraced non-alignment. Non-alignment largely from a point of weakness, because ideally we should be joining the war to defend our continent and to defend our people. But Europe and the US have amassed so much power, so much resources that African countries joining one group or the other calls for their continued devastation. But we continue to see wars even on the continent itself, whether it's the Sudan, uh, uh, Mali, uh, the broader Sahel region, Somalia, Central African Republic, Mozambique, Cabo Delgado. But all of these are protracted conflicts and instability in other areas, including the Democratic Republic uh, of Congo. But you can always see the manifestation of uh, interest of European countries in all of these uh, uh, institutions. At the same time, uh, we continue to have the United Nations, uh, particularly its Security Council, which has become completely useless in interventions on world affairs, except as a crony and instrument used by Europe and the United States. And therefore, these developments are actually affecting the African unity, African progress and development, 
And it is in this regard that uh, the SACP and other comrades are collaborating in this uh, development of the uh, Africa Left Network Forum and will appreciate collaborations with the uh, European left parties and other progressive forces to build peace on the continent and in the world and to see more collaborations uh, in this regard. Thank you very much. We'll send our broad uh, uh, presentation uh, because of the time limits to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Soli. Thank you so much for your intervention. I. I'm very happy because all of you, you are uh, pointing out uh, a next point, a next stage in our collaboration, in our possibilities to, to work together. We are with, uh, writing everything down and we hope that this is the first uh, of many conversations like this. Um, thank you so much. Now we are going to hear uh, Soli uh, Mapaila. Um, uh, sorry, we are. We have heard you, and uh, now we are hearing Maria Teresa uh, de Faria Santana. You cannot talk twice today. Sorry, sorry. Uh, she is member of the Political Commission and the National Council of Democratic Bloc Party (DB) uh, from Angola. Thank you so much, Maria Teresa. Uh, we are hearing you. Good afternoon, comrades. Uh, it's good to meet you and to see you all. Uh, I practically do, do not know none of you. It's the first time, uh, apart from Kwezi. We are very close comrades. We have been working quite a long time in Ghana. So, uh, but anyone else, uh, it's, it's in my pleasure to meet you all. Of course, I've been, give, been given quite a tall order to, to speak about neocolonialism, fascism, and the liberation and the liberation from fascism and dictatorship. So it is quite a whole pack of issues that uh, have to be addressed. Um, I'm trying to focus my, um, my talk on violence because all those themes are to do with um, the kind of violence that is state violence and organized violence by the state. Uh, those happen within fascism. I'm not referring here on the classical fascism that we live in, a, or that existed in uh, in Italy uh, with Mussolini and others. But we have a new brand of fascism that come to the right, a re revivalism of that new fascism. We may say, and, and we are living in in my country in particular because we've been having quite uh, a, spe a specific history of not only being colonized by, uh, for the decades by a fascist state and that period of, of, fasc of fascism of the, the Portuguese state because we're being colonized by the Portuguese. And so then my first language is Portuguese actually not uh, even, able to speak my national language. I don't have a national language that's supposed to, to be speaking on. And uh, the suppression of language, the suppression of all rights, the suppression of all liberties in the colony of Angola um, as being the tradition, this the spin-off of our history. Uh, all attempts of, of struggle in the last century against colonialism in, in Angola, that, that struggle has to develop into armed struggle because it was the only way to confront colonialism and fascism. And when the two put together was a, it was a terrible situation in the colonies. So Angola emerged from the beginning as a colony and a colony in the, in the vital sense of a penal colony because many of the resistance in Portugal who fight, who, who fought against the, the, the system in Portugal, all the people are criminals and so on, they were sent there as a, a penal colony. So we have um, uh, loads of uh, prisons and throughout the country that where those, those peoples were, where in fact the Portuguese were left, they did want in the society in Portugal, so they were sent, sent there. And that our colonization and settler colonization started. So something similar to Australia, 
kind of situations. If you see the kind of violence that the indigenous people meet with, uh, apart from the physical colonization start in the kingdom with the destruction of the kingdom or empire of Congo, and that is being divided into three. We have now the DRC that used to be Zaire and Congo Brazzaville, that is, uh, we have the Belgian Congo and the French Congo, and also the Portuguese Congo, that is Angola today. So the Kingdom of Congo was, was, was uh, separated into three different entities for, during the partition on the, after the Berlin Conference. So fast forwarding because I will be able to, uh, to, to go back to the, all the historical issues, but they are quite important in the terms of addressing violence and the nature of the violence we meet today in, our own, in this part of Africa. Um, dictatorship in Portugal, of course, could not be um, destroyed without the participation of the Portuguese people, and they have to find uh, in Portugal itself for the destruction of Portugal and uh, uh, of fascism in Portugal. And that anti-fascist struggle, of course, has strong connections with uh, national liberation struggle in Angola against colonialism. And that is the relationship between the left and the, uh, the liberation movement in Africa, in the, in the Portuguese colonies, was quite strong, particularly with the Communist Party and all the Socialist Party, or all progressive uh, forces in Portugal. And they, they had quite a big role in the process of uh, this decolonization. And that was also set violently by the army, because it was, it was on the 25th of April that was the um, the revolution in Portugal that then was the spearhead of coming to put an end to armed struggle and resistance within the colonies and set for independence. Angola became independent in, 19, in 1975 through, of course, violence. At the day of the uh, independence was proclaimed, with still bombs falling a few a few kilometers from the capital where the independence was being proclaimed and, the, and uh, our flag was being hasted. So we were still under, under fire and under struggle. But the big problem with this, uh, particularly in, 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 in the left, is the, uh, is the uh, absence of complexity. We normally look at uh, the struggles in the, in, in the colonies and we examine it, we have, oh, we have this, this, this particular movement that is progressive with which we have relationships, you know, and somewhat to Africa is not being seen the complexity of the problem. First, because our countries are not just one entity. They're made up with different nations, there are composites. We are all composites. We are being put together arbitrarily. We didn't, you know, able to develop naturally as an organically as it was supposed to be. And then we have been put together as nations as it is, and we progress into become states, exactly maintain the same structure. This structure that is being a legacy of colonialism is an hindrance to further solidarity, to further our struggle, to further coming together, to further even being able to meet uh, directly and communicate. As it's a simple thing that if I want to, uh, to go to Ghana, you have to go around, you have to come back to, to Europe, pick another plane and go back to Africa to, do, to go to another country. So that's the way it's been designed by colonial. We are not being able after six, seven, almost seven decades of independence to change that trend. And that is very dangerous. And that is one of the problems that, that we have within as the left in, in, in Africa itself, and also as the left internationally, because there's very, there's so much care in dealing with Africa, because Africa plays an important role in the world, because not a single power or superpower in the world is able 
to come to that stage without go passing through Africa, not a single one. So, and we need to understand that importance, how, how, how pivotal it is, the fact that Africa is at the center of, the, of building capacity for any nation to be able to become come at the top of the pipe. It happens to any single power that you know, any uh, the imperial power or hegemon that is raising on, on the face of this earth, that all of them have to go through Africa. So if it's no different now. So when we talk about independence, so the issue of decolonization becomes crucial. So how did we decolonize? as these African states that emerged after an independence, did we decolonize? Is the decoloni decolonization an act or is it a process? So as far as we are concerned, uh, decolonization is a process. And I think in our, in our understanding, a long one, because Africa could not, uh, could not be able to, to decolonize by proclaiming independence alone. And political independence, as uh, Kwesi said, but, uh, so when he cited Nkrumah, uh, is, uh, is, is meaningless unless the whole of Africa, pardon? Uh, could you please conclude? Sorry to ask. Okay. Do you need to conclude? Thank you. So I need to conclude. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, it's so it's so short the time to be able to address the, these main issues that are that are supposed to raise. Um, but I would like to 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 close that one to conclude. Although we didn't say how much time I have, and um, it's one minute or two. <laughs> I want to know if I have one minute or two. You have one minute to conclude. One okay. minute. Let, let, let me complete then. So because I didn't even come to the point to be able to, to raise the issues concerning Angola today and the fact of uh, even to a state or to our party is. But what I would like to say is that um, to conclude that we'll be able to come again that uh, the time that is uh, that is open, that because it's in a study of the conversation, that this conversation continues, that we're able then to be able to open up different issues, particular the issue of violence in Africa and how violence is orchestrated and organized and directed to make sure that we are not able to organize ourselves, to meet ourselves and to ourselves set up an agenda build for our own liberation. And that's how, how we end there. Thank you, Teresa. So sorry uh, to, for asking you to conclude. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. So I wanted to introduce Guy Magusania who is a uh, MP and a uh, member of FRAP for Senegal. I wanted to thank him because uh, there is a repression against uh, his uh, party. Lots of his comrades are in jail. And I know that they are threatened. So I wanted to thank him to take the time to come and see us today. Guy Marius, uh, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. You have uh, <laughs> the same time as the others. Thank you very much, Felix. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all my friends and comrades. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Felix, it is true what you said. It's true that all of the commission meetings and also all of the meetings at the parliament and we have comrades we need to see. Some of them are in jail. Some of them are still at the police station and uh, they've been arrested. Today, I am at uh, the uh, FRAP headquarters and we're going to see um, organizations from 10 African movements. This is also why it's going to be difficult for me to stay until the end of 
our meeting, but I still wanted to be here with you and to talk, to discuss and to exchange views with you on this day of the liberation of Africa for uh, questions that um, interest us all. So what I've been asked to do today is to talk about the uh, what's at stake with uh, imperialism and the environment as well. So the first thing I wanted to say to remind you of what could be helpful for us the interpreter apologizes unfortunately there is uh, some trouble with uh, the internet connection at Gemarius's end we can't hear what is being said sorry we're going to wait a little for him to reconnect. I'm not sure what to do. Should we stop the um, recording or not? No, um, no, because today um, we can continue uh, with our next uh, guest, uh, while maybe uh, Mario Sagna can join. Is that okay? We can continue maybe. Uh, with Aminata Traoré. Okay. I don't know what happened. I'm really sorry about it. So today, there are questions with the urban areas. They are workers there and I would say that nature is also important so maybe you saw lately that Senegal is part of um, the six countries in which 20 percent of fishes are uh, caught illegally this is research that has been made which tells us that. So 20% of uh, fishing is done illegally in six countries, among which Senegal, all African countries, of course. This leads to problems and also uh, to the fishing in Africa, especially in Senegal. So fishing in Africa is subject to uh, fishing agreements that have been signed with uh, the European Union, and it leads to many problems with the ecosystems, especially with uh, the scarcity of resources. And quite often, there are European fishing boats coming over, but also Russian ones and Chinese ones. And this is a threat for uh, fisheries from Senegal because now we can see that there is a scarcity of fishes to be caught by uh, the Senegalese population. It's a huge problem. It means also that uh, uh, fishermen do not really have access to these resources. And to do so, these fishermen need to go even further. So this is why we see Senegalese fishermen that uh, because they, they go too far and they go to Mauritania, uh, we see that uh, the 200,000 square meters are not enough. So it means they are shot at by uh, the a policeman from uh, Mauritania, they have to go to Guinea even, and they also have to uh, help migrants through borders illegally because they don't have enough money to be able to survive.
And so they have to collaborate in this human trafficking. So this is an, an example of capitalism and uh, its impact because through boats, they are using our fishing resources and deprive our population from uh, protein rich food. This also has, of course, an impact on fauna and flora. So yes, indeed, we have to, ha to act and we should review and change the agreements, the fishing agreements that uh, were concluded by the um, Benin, Ghana, and other countries. Uh, because these fishing agreements are not interesting. They are using it, exploiting our resources and destroy the, the fauna and flora in our seas during the last budget uh, the budgeting uh, exercise that happened here at the Ghana uh, General Assembly I had called upon the um, environment ministry uh, about the number of uh, uh, people that are protecting the environment here in Senegal sorry and uh, Let's face it, we had less than, fewer than 1,000 uh, forest agents to protect our forests in Senegal. Why? Well, simply because capitalism becomes imperialism when it comes to our country. Thanks to the World Bank, the IMF. And they control our budgets, the budgets of our states. And of course, protection of environment, of our environment is not a pr priority of capitalism. They do impose our rules, our budgets. And our, our governments are accomplice to it and so we do not have enough money to recruit agents that are protecting the environment there's not enough money to um, provide with our population provide our population with the normal health systems they deserve that's why we shouldn't be surprised to see the senegalese forest uh, decreasing the last years Uh, significant decrease simply because the government does not afford enough resources to our environmental soldiers and there's not enough equipment to protect the forest from illegal logging this is why as we speak Desert is increasing and deforestation also in areas uh, such as uh, Casamance, which was really well known for being a very green area. Now, zirconium is also um, exploited in the region. Zirconium is a very important mineral that is being uh, used uh, and it is being uh, collected in uh, this region. So, Zircon is being mined in the, this region, but also in all the area that is around the desert of Lamboul. There's a company called Eramet and another company 
an Australian uh, company that is uh, exploiting uh, the Zircon, the buzzard. They are mining it. And the issue is that when they do not mine it properly, once they've uh, used it, the soil it becomes barren. Uh, everything where you would plant afterwards would not grow. It's impossible. So it has an impact on the population, of course, but there's also a major um, environmental repercussion. Finally, the neoliberalism that was imposed on us by IMF and the World Bank. And I must say it again, with the uh, complicity of our governments and bourgeoisie, well, these policies do make our people poorer. Let me give you an example. When you agree with um, trade agreement that makes your importation easier, when your currency makes importation e easier, well, all these importations c come and compete with your own producers. What happens is that peasants do produce less, and when they produce, it's difficult for them to sell because there's a high uh, competitivity on the market. So, for example, you should know that we import a lot of maize, of corn. It comes from accidental Western countries. Sorry. So, if we import so much, well, the people here are not using local crops such as mill, millet, uh, sorgho, and others which have a better nutrient composition, but you do um, deprive our peasants from these revenues. C could you conclude, please? The other issue is that Readers and peasants have to, at the end of the day, uh, do illegal logging to create coal, coal and use it uh, to have more resources. Sorry, uh, that's what I wanted to say as an introduction on this topic, which was the environmental and economic uh, stakes. Uh, regarding imperialism and uh, mining. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sagna. We agree that uh, we all need more time, more time to discuss and more time to organize. Um, right now we are going to talk with our next uh, panelist, Aminata uh, Traore. She is the former Minister of Culture of Mali. Uh, welcome, uh, Aminata. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, I must say that uh, I've had uh, technical issues. Uh, there's been... Uh, a energy sorted. Um, so, I would like to talk about war. War in a country, and I'm not talking only about Mali, this is also the case of uh, Niger, Chad, Burkina Faso, and nowadays the prevailing uh, discourse is to say that uh, this region is a threat to the global stability. And I'm against this narrative. Of course, I'm fighting it. It, it is biased. When you talk about war in Mali and other any other interventions by um, 
foreign military forces, it's it's a lie. It's based on lies. And it's also based on state terrorism. We are forced to agree on a narrative that does put you in a situation in which you have to buy weapons to defend your country. But the security is at stake, is in jeopardy because of imperialism and the capitalistic system. Sadly, I'm still waiting for clear statements from the elites in Africa on capitalism. Because if you go back in time and to the creation of the Pan-African organization, it, it is now 16 years old, but it is flawed from its origins. It was the There was a liberal aspect, a liberal wing that prevailed and time showed that we were right when I'm and I'm talking about the left wing. Because the left is the one fighting for Mali. Comrade François Hollande came here and said it would be a fast, a quick fight against terrorism in six months, and it was not true. And the same happened with the unemployment in France. So he came here and said that the war was won. But it was not true. It need, even, even after 10 years, it's still not the case. And the same social socialists, uh, but also the far right, all the, all the French people are coming here but they do not take responsibility. This heavy responsibility of the military intervention failure. And they say that the responsibility is ours. In the we, We've seen now that there's been the uh, war in Ukraine. And so from the get go, the objective was not to free Mali was not to protect the Mali people. No, I was always wondering about that. How industrialized nations, and I'm not only talking about uh, Europe, for two or three decades, decades, we've seen a war against migrants. And the first migrants targeted by the chosen migration. And so the first one were the people from Mali. These people are not fleeing because they want to. They are not leaving the country just because they want to. We know that in, in our case, in the case of Niger and other countries, in the 70s and 80s, our system of production, of solidarity, were um, undermined and people started to leave the country. So, what happened in the 80s have led to this. That's why when we are taking stock of the situation today, people just realize that they do not have the means for a decent life in their own country. This is true for the to all the, the region, if you look at the, these countries, you can see that these areas that are the most exposed to desertification are also the areas where we see the most people leaving and the most terrorism. So what I want to see from today on, on this day of... Africa's liber liberation, I would like to be a testament and to tell to the people in the rest of Africa that Mali is not the issue.
Mali is not the, the center of uh, jihadism. That's the narrative, but that's not true. And the UN mission is also a failure. They came with the back and force and the UN force came together for a war that was supposed to last for just a little while and should have ended uh, the Islamic terrorism and make the country safe. And we are very far from these results. But France and their allies are st saying that it's not their fault. And now their new argument is saying that everything is because of Putin. That's a new argument. They've decided at the assembly that uh, Wagner is a terrorist group now, which means that Mali is now considered as a sponsor of terrorism because of jihadism, but also because we've used cooperation with Russia, even if Wagner is not uh, seen as a uh, part of the Russian military. So now the, the new issue for Mali is Russia. So really, whatever happens, the, the, we've always, always seen a political will from the former colonial power to conquer our territory. France is losing its markets in Africa. And so Mali is the uh, starting point and they want to get access to the resources. So to, to, to be, to conclude uh, and in short, my struggle today is to really highlight, and this is something we've always said, there is no solution other than changing the economic paradigm. This could save Africa from many injuries and crises. The health crisis, for example, the COVID crisis showed the limits of the system. The energy crisis that's happening right now with the war in Ukraine. We, these countries that want to come back to Africa and hunt terrorism, uh, they do it just because they, they, they don't respect us. They don't respect sub-Saharan Africa, the, 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 the black people. We have two million refugees. And still they keep asking us to organize elections and to go to the elections and vote. They say that you just have, we just have to uh, reform our political, our government, our political structure as if reforms and elections would solve everything. No, these elections are just there to put in office people that are in favor of capitalism. So the responsibility of the African elite is that they have accepted capitalism. They want to make money fast. That's the issue. If we want to update the debate on Africa and the liberation of Africa in this uh, geopolitical context, we need to explain what de development we want, what has been uh, implemented since the 80s. Is it democracy, really? When you look at what's happening in France, France that has created the crisis uh, that's happening right now on the uh, uh, um, pension reform. It's the same story. I would like that all the parties of the left open their eyes and stop looking at Mali in a patronizing way by saying, this is a country with no democracy. No, we haven't been given the 
opportunity to create a real democracy because the neoliberalistic system wants states to be there for uh, under the umbrella of other countries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andinata. Thank you, Aminata. Thank you for respecting uh, the time afforded. I haven't had to uh, signal you to stop. I felt it. I knew I had to come to an end. Now, I will give the floor to the youngest member of today, if I'm not mistaken, Ashlyn Ajambo, who is Secretary of Ideology and International Affairs for the Communist Party in Kenya. She's a young feminist that is uh, working on the feminist uh, struggle, but also the youth struggle. I will afford you 10 minutes. And we are very happy to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Congrete. Greetings, Congrete. Uh, it's such an honor to be part of this discussion. And I'd like to appreciate all the Congrets who have come before me, from Comrade Maite to Comrade Aminata, the, those who are so uh, insightful, you know, talking about the imperialist wars fought in Africa, the elective politics that are pro bourgeoisie of the North, and there's so many dilemmas of humanity that we face in the continent. Uh, so basically, I'll start by saying that the African Liberation Day is an opportunity for us uh, to celebrate the victories that we have achieved, you know, as a united people, not just from the African continent, but from all over the world, and to recommit ourselves uh, to the ongoing struggles uh, towards the total liberation of the working class. It also serves as a reminder that despite uh, gaining independence for the African you know, countries. Um, majority of the African countries still are under the rule of the foreign finance capital of most of the imperialist countries. And we know that uh, imperialism is manifesting as the supreme principal uh, enemy for the African continent. So LD is also a new chance for us uh, to basically reflect upon and redefine um, Pan-Africanism because for, a, for the longest time, Pan-Africanism has been an um, ideology, you know, has been the objective, but we know that the software to our total freedom as the African people is scientific socialism. So my topic today was on the youth and feminist uh, emancipation, yeah, youth and feminism emancipation. So I'll start by, you know, bringing out uh, the class character of the youth and women. So I'll use the context of Kenya. So I get that the Kenyan society is sharply divided into a 0 0.1 filthy minority rich uh, against a 99.9 .9 poor majority and struggling masses. So we cannot, um, you know, view the youth or women as wholly um, as a monolithic entity or rather a homogeneous kind of a group. But we have to, you know, accept that, you know, the youth and the women are homogeneous population, you know, we have class structures uh, within the youth and the women. And you can't say that a win for any youth or a win for a rich youth is a win for all the youth. And on the, on the other hand, we can't say that a win for any woman is a win for all the women. So basically, what you're saying that the sense of Marxism has demonstrated that uh, the sections of we of women and youth are shaped and conditioned by their social, you know, conditions or rather their class. So basically, the interest of the youth of the zero point one uh, minority 
are very antagonistic to the interests of uh, the 99.9 .9, uh, youth and women. So you'll get that um, the former are interested in maintaining the class privileges of the rich, uh, which is full of primitive accumulation, while uh, uh, the, the latter, which is the majority of women and youth, which are the poor and struggling masses, only rely on their labor, which they sell it to the bourgeoisie market so that they can survive. So from this, uh, we cannot, you know, uh, wholly say that the interest of the youth and women are one because we have these classes. So it is high time that the youth and women recognize that uh, or identify with their own class interest. But if they keep on confusing their interest with the interest of the rich, then they'll be harboring you know, their own enemy. So I'll go back to the youth now. So I'll try to talk about the youth in politics here in Kenya. So you'll get that in Kenya, the youth agenda has increasingly uh, dominated the political scene. And this is especially during the campaign and election period, uh, because this is when the masses are usually activated. And also because the youth continue to bear the heaviest bands of systemic crisis that we face in this decadent system. So, and this is not just limited to the electioneering period, but even right now in Kenya, uh, apart from the Kenya's 2023 finance bill, uh, the youth equation is one of the most heated and debated topics in the country because it has a lot to do with the nature of how the Kenyan politics is played. So the youth have been conditioned that elections must only adhere to the doctrine of tyranny of numbers, you know, while being used as conduits uh, for ethnic political violence, handouts, as well as mere election statistics to determine uh, or tilt uh, election results for the pro bourgeoisie led uh, political elites. So uh, I'll say that, you know, the democratization of Africa through the promotion of elective politics, you know, strengthening of democratic um, institutions, uh, constitutionalism and rule of law with the assumption that only democracies inspire stability and good governance in the African continent is uh, continuously becoming a menace because the so-called uh, bourgeoisie elections uh, bereft of ideological struggle is what has reduced youth into mere objects of rubber stamping repressive and you know uh, repressive regimes each and every five years so you get that the youth keep on recycling the same leaders uh hoping for you know different results but we know this you know ideological bareness of um of the african politics or rather the kenyan politics as you know inhabited change for the people or for people who are desperate for this change and what we are saying is that it's high time that the youth stand tall and oppose this kind of convention kind of politics which are used to reward the youth from the rich strata while silence the youth of the poor strata and also it's also important to recognize uh, that a uh, marxism has a, there is a lot of prejudices that has been embedded on the Marxist ideology. You know, in Kenya, they say that Marxism is divisive, Marxism is violent. So it is quite disheartening that the youth have, you know, cling to the false hope and, uh, and false promises that only these elections is what will um, emancipate them from the harsh, uh, material conditions and social economic problems that they have been pushed to live with. But we know that only Marxism has revealed the true nature of how exploitive and oppressive the system is. So it's high time that the youth recognize that um, we cannot legislate 
ourselves from the inherent crisis of capitalism. It's a time we join the revolutionary struggle and work towards overthrowing this barbaric system that has you know, failed to meet the needs of humanity. So with that, I'll also like to talk about the women because I'm on the youth. So it is important to recognize that capitalism uh, is an ally of patriarchy. And this reveals the reality that female uh, oppression is a trans class phenomenon that affects all the women, not just merely uh, the poor working uh, women. And we know that male supremacy is one of the oldest and most basic form of domination. And technically, politics is da is is termed sorry as a male sorry as a man's world. So when we talk about you know international politics war and such like things it's termed as a as a man's domain or as a male domain but i think through uh these international conferences and universal declaration in favor of feminist or rather female equality uh there has been some shift in how uh, the society used to view women but however this has not you know changed the real conditions of the working class women so basically we are saying that marxism ideology and the marxist movements have been able to champion for uh, female equality and women rights while regarding women oppression as a phenomena that cannot be eradicated without overturning this system of capitalism. So with capitalism, there can never be the liberation of women. So in order for us to change, okay, congrats. So um, I know today we were talking about uh, the quest of building international solidarity. So in conclusion, I'll say that um, the struggles of youth and women are at the center of how do we want um, a new society. And I think one of the basic things that we can take up so as to bring or to build this um, international solidarity is making political and ideological um, education the centerpiece of our strategies. Thank you so much, Kongre. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. I would like to make a suggestion as uh, I have five minutes and you have five minutes, Nora. I would like to give some of my floor time uh, to Mara Teresa, if she could explain what happens in Angola. and. I will conclude very briefly in two minutes and then I will give the floor to my other colleague, Nora, to conclude. So, Maria Teresa, if you want to talk, the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you so much for giving me these minutes. But what I wanted to just to complete because I was not able to, uh, to, to come to tackle that is that it, there is a a common understanding that the movements that came from the liberation struggle who raised, we waged the armed struggle are from the left. Uh, and that is one of the biggest mistakes and one of the biggest problems that we have in Angola because MPLA is still today as part of the international socialist and is being, being praised by most of the left in the world, the global left, because of the, the, the role that it played in, in on the period of the struggle about independence. But it will take a long time to explain that phenomena. The MPLA is a fascist construct. Is not is it, we have a regime of autocracy in Angola. The most repressive that we have known is worse than the colonial that the colonial fascist state. So therefore we cannot real uh, we need to pay attention to the way we do analysis and we analyze and i am from the the, the democratic party the bloc democratic party that has been uh, is being is being in existence for the last 10 years is a decade now and and it is a spin off 
of the Angolan communist organization. So therefore, that part of history is that background was the, the, the last thing that I want to explain that is important to know that. And the left in Angola was exterminated by the MPLA. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I just think that we need more minutes. We all need more minutes. I think we are excited about hearing about uh, all of uh, our analysis and also uh, a lot of proposals um, that we can uh, work in common. Um, I don't know, Felix, I can speak like briefly and just uh, say, say goodbyes. Uh, I just want to point out that even though, as Maria Teresa was saying, is uh, some of us is the first time we are seeing each other. I think we have a lot on, of common. On common. I think that um, we are concerned about uh, common challenges. I think that we need also um, to tackle uh, the a lot of issues. Uh, for instance, uh, this absence of complexity uh, that uh, which we see the world through. Uh, we need also to think together uh, this concept of security. We need to think um, of, about what Equesi was saying, uh, making campaigns against a foreign military bases, right? Because that's uh, uh, for sure, um, something that means that neocolonialism exists, right? So I think we have a lot of com in common in our analysis and also a lot of opportunities to build together to fight also uh, Eurocentrism from our side, to uh, learn from what's going on in Africa and also think about how to tackle common struggles. I think that uh, this African left forum that uh, the comrades from South Africa were mentioning is very interesting. So I, I really think that uh, we have to do uh, more of these um, uh, discussions. I think that um, for us has been very enriching to hear all of you. And um, I don't know, I just want to say that I hope that this is the first step to build uh, bridges for, for working together. Uh, Felix, you have three minutes of my time. Let's share our time, share our knowledge and share also a better future. So you can speak. Thank you very much, Nora. I was giving my three minutes to Teresa, but uh, <laughs> what I wanted to say is to thank you, Nora, first for all the efforts so that we could organize this meeting, which will be online tomorrow. So thank you very much for your efforts. Thanks for liaising with Sylvia and uh, also Maite and uh, Pierre as well. So thank you, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I was uh, really interested in knowing the witnesses from uh, all of our participants. As Maria Teresa said, we could exchange details. We have to talk more. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, all of you who have spoken about Pan-Africanism, its history. Thank you to Solima Paila, to Kwesi Pratt, to Maite Mola. Thanks to Soli for talking about the approach of the left. I thank everyone. Ashleen from Kenya, thanks to everyone. And all I wanted to add is that in so many countries, you have what is called the median part of the population. It means that there is an age which divides the population into two types of age. So it's 17% in Mali, for example, and it's a population which is plays an important role. So we have a capitalistic view, 
with economies that do not enable us to create enough resources and employ enough uh, jobs for these youngsters. This is something that is going to implode at some stage and the capitalistic system, well, we need to change it. We need to change paradigm so that uh, we can implement new human development policies or we go straight into the wall. So this is all I wanted to say. We need to work together to change these views. Thank you very much to all of you. Aminata, thanks to. I know that uh, Aminata had a very heavy agenda until today and she presented as well. Thanks to Guy Marius. And to Amori as well. And thanks as well to the interpreters. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to understand each other because some speak English and others speak French. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.